Welcome everyone to Coach Connect Hub. We are uh, welcoming today our guest speaker, Todd Mitchell. Todd is a cybersecurity expert. Todd, I'm so happy that you're here today to share four fundamentals that we all need to know. Todd, uh, take it away for us. All right. Well, thank you for having me, Sam. Um, yeah, today I want to discuss the four core ways that you can get cybersecurity uh, from your desk for free. Uh, these are easy. They just take a few minutes of your time. And um, I'm going to go ahead and start my slide. And so the, the four core ways to get free cybersecurity for your business. And... Uh, Here's the, the agenda, which is actually the four things. So we're going to talk about multi-factor authentication, unique user accounts and strong passwords, security updates, and social engineering awareness. Um, multi-factor authentication um, is referred to as MFA. Sometimes you, you hear it called two-factor authentication. Uh, it goes by the premise that as a person, you have something that you have, something that you know, and something that you are. So the something you are would be a fingerprint or a retina scan. The something you know is like your password, the answers to the security questions that you have to fill out to get your, you know, when you do online banking and things like that. And something you have is something that's in your possession. Um, sometimes it's a, 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 like with the military, it's a, a, a smart card that you have to shove into your computer to get it to turn on. Uh, most commonly, it's your cell phone. And so using multi-factor authentication, the most common thing that you'll notice is every time you go to log into your bank, they send you a text with a code that you got to have. So if I was to hack your username and password for your bank account, but I don't have my, I don't have your cell phone in my possession, then I can't get in. So that's a good way of, of um, making sure that it's just an extra layer of protection to make sure you're the only one that can log into these accounts. And then for unique user account and strong passwords. So one thing I want to point out with this is um, making sure that your password is strong. And you'll notice that the like the, the last example uh, on the, in the dark green area here, and it's, and it's talking about, you know, learn from anyone is a, a good password. It's like a phrase or keep it locked down. Um, I walked two miles today, something like that. And then what you want to do to make it even stronger is you need to mix symbols and numbers in with the letters. And there's two reasons why you're doing that. One is if you just use letters, there's only 26 letters. If you use every available key on your keyboard, that's 109 possibilities that they have to guess what that is uh, for each character in your password. The second thing to it is if you've ever used a PDF or Word document and searched for a word inside that document, it's instantaneous results of, you know, you can open a 200 page PDF and search for the word, uh, you know, marketing, and it'll come up instantly with a list of every page that it found it on. That's how long it takes to crack your password if your password has words that are found in a dictionary. So by taking all the E's or A's and turning them into, you know, at signs or number threes or something like that, you're mixing it up and turning it into gobbledygook that can't be found in the dictionary. So that's the strongest way to make a password. Um, you want it to be at least 12 characters long, have capital letters, small letters, numbers, and symbols. Um, and the, the main passwords that you really, really, really need to be diligent about in, in, if you're not going to do this for every password is to make sure that the ones that log devices... In other words, your Gmail account that you use to log into your Android phone, your Apple ID that you use to log into your Apple devices, your Microsoft account that you use to log into your Windows computers, those three um, main accounts that you have are super important to keep secure because if somebody can get into your device, they can get to all the rest of your accounts and all your other passwords. Uh, okay, so software updates. Um, I want to uh, highlight that Windows and Apple both have settings that you can put them on automatically. So they just automatically do all the updates as they come in. And every once in a while, it requires a restart. Uh, Windows does password, uh, password, does software patching every Tuesday. 
So every Wednesday morning when you wake up and, and turn on your computer, you need to do a restart. Um, and it will prompt you to do that. But you, the best way to do this is to keep it on automatic because these are very important because as these operating systems, as the bad guys find ways to hack into them, they, they're constantly patching those holes and making sure that nobody can get in after that uh, vulnerability has been exposed. So you want to stay up to date on those patches because if somebody looks at your computer and says, oh, you're, you're, you haven't had any patches in a month, which means that thing we found last week, you're still vulnerable and now they know how to get into your computer. So it's important to keep those uh, up to date and um, <clears throat> the security settings are another one. Um, I'm not going to go over everything, everything on this slide, but I want to point out the, the biggest one that I see is the first one of uh, changing your default, whoops, sorry, uh, changing your default login and password, not the Wi-Fi one, but the actual username and password to get into your router itself. Most routers come out of the box with the username as admin and the password as password. And you can find this on the internet in about 10 seconds. Uh, so it's something that's really important for you to get in there and check the settings and change the password to be something more secure. Uh, and uh, as far as security settings go, making sure that your firewalls are turned on, making sure your antivirus is turned on and running, um, schedule it to do quick scans. They have what they call um, full scans that run uh, periodically, and then there's a quick scan that runs uh, almost in real time constantly. And using using those settings to make sure that that's actually happening is, is how you can keep yourself safe. Um, they'll scan any incoming attachments in your emails, They'll scan websites that you go to. They'll scan USBs that you plug into your computer or CDs or DVDs that you play. Um, that's still a thing anymore. I think that's kind of obsolete now, but um, they'll take all that media that's coming into your computer and they'll scan it before it gets in as well as keeping in track of things in your uh, in your system folders and, and making sure that there's no malicious software in there. Um, <clears throat> Another thing you can do if you use Microsoft Office is have uh, attachments open in protected mode. Um, sometimes this is set by default to be on that way, but sometimes it's not. So you might want to go in there and make sure it is if, if, if you use Microsoft Office products. I believe uh, Adobe products can also do the same type of thing. Um, and that's where you'll see on here, it'll come up with a little banner and you got to hit the enable editing button before you can do anything to the document. If you downloaded it, somebody emailed it to you or you downloaded it from the internet. And the reason why this is important is because these documents are no longer like they were 20 years ago where it was just a piece of paper with typing on it. These documents are able to embed code into them. And if you download a document and it's in enabled with editing already as soon as you download that document malicious code can start executing and, and download something onto your computer or take your computer over or something like that so you want to make sure that this is um, opening in what they call safe mode so you have to click a button first because that gives you a chance to kind of look at it and make sure that it's from a reliable source and it's the document you thought it was going to be before you uh, uh, enable editing on it and then the, the, the big area I wanted to talk about is social engineering awareness. So um, there's two reasons why people do phishing attacks is, is most commonly what we hear called. Uh, and there's two reasons why people use social engineering to get uh, information from you. First of all, they want to steal your money. So it's just a quick uh, way of trying to either get your identity so they can open credit cards in your name and use them or it's a way to actually get to your bank account and steal money from you or extort you into sending them money voluntarily. The second reason why they wanna do this is to take over your computer and download software onto it, uh, either ransomware attacks, which means they take over your computer and, and hide your data and won't give it back unless you pay them. Or um, the, the recent one that we've saw because of the Ukraine war, they shut off the internet. Russia can't directly get to the Ukraine 
via the internet. So they go to America and take over your computer and use your computer to get to the Ukraine. <laughs> so that's called a bot. Um, so you become part of the bot army for some Russian hacker. Um, so the ways that this happens most commonly is emails, uh, although texts are right up there with them. Um, and you just have to use common sense. Uh, you have to look at these emails. And if it sounds a little too good to be true, it probably is. Um, you know, this one's supposed to be coming from a bank. If you hover your mouse over this link, it shows up down in the bottom of your browser with the address that it's actually going to send you to. And you look, and if those two aren't the same, then you know something's not quite right. This one has misspelled words. The copyright's 10 years old. You're looking at it going, okay, you know, you know that a major bank is going to update its copyright every year. Um, so just doing these types of things just kind of gives you an idea that, hey, this might not be right. Plus, you also have to take a look at where it originated from and why they sent it to you. Uh, you know, if, you, if you're getting emails from places you've never got them from before, you know, some bank you used and they've never contacted you before, why are they doing it now all of a sudden? Um, here's another example. And this one, um, I'm getting an email telling me my annual plan's been renewed and there's a copy of the receipt from PayPal. Uh, but if you look at the address that it came from, it's like UGFJ something at gmail.com. That is not a PayPal business email address. <laughs> that's that's not even a forwarded by MailChimp or something. Um, and then the other thing you can notice, it went to undisclosed recipients. So that means they sent this thing out to a whole bunch of people on blind Co's copy. So how is everybody else getting a copy of my same receipt? So that's kind of fishy. And then the third thing, that, or fourth thing, I guess, to point out is if you're familiar with documents on a computer, you'll notice right away that this is supposed to be a one piece of paper in a PDF. And one page PDFs are in kilobytes, not megabytes. So this thing is literally 100 to 1,000 times bigger than it's supposed to be, which tells me right there that there's malicious code inside this just waiting for me to click the button and download it while I'm looking at their little one page receipt. So um, here's some other examples. I've, I've gotten a text and an email, both from the same place, telling me that supposedly from authorized customer or web app, something that's supposed to be from Amazon service telling me that my account's been locked. Uh, this came to my business email. My Amazon's in my wife's name, uh, has absolutely nothing to do with my business. So this is right up. I knew it was spam anyways. The other thing I'll notice, you'll notice on here where I circled, it looks like it came from a secure website because it's HTTPS, which is secure instead of HTTP. But if you notice the S is on the other side of the, the semicolons. Uh, so they kind of just did a little eye trick on you to kind of visually make you think it's a secure website when it's not. Um, and then in the text, they didn't even spell Amazon, right? <laughs> um, so these are just ways that they're sending you. And here's another text I got telling me it was from EBT or something and my card's been locked and I got to call this phone number. Doesn't say what card, where, and I know for a fact that the bank I use, every text message comes in and it's from a five digit number with a no reply. It's not a 1-800 number or 377 something area code you know so i know this is just bogus um another thing you'll notice this goes back to the uh, early days of the um invasion into ukraine but what they were doing was you'd go to a certain website and it doesn't even have to be a, it was random uh and all of a sudden your computer would just get all these pop-ups one after the other that supposedly are from Windows Defender or your firewall telling you you're being hacked and you got to click this button to fix it. Um, what these guys are doing, and also with this one, they had some loud screaming alarm that played over your speakers that was really nice. So everybody wants to click a button just to shut the thing up. Um, but what they're trying to do is, if you've ever downloaded software before, um, you always get that little pop-up from Windows that says, you know, this this software is trying to make changes to your computer. Do you want to let it? Yes or no. And you have to click yes. And the reason why is your operating system, Windows or Apple, is smart enough to know that they want a user's permission to be able to download software. So what happens is 
they have on here, they are basically making a window and the buttons are the size of the window, even though it's transparent. So you can't see. So on here, it looks like you're hitting cancel or okay, or the X or something to minimize the window. But in reality, anything you click anywhere on this screen is just gonna give Windows permission to download the software. So the best thing to do in this situation is hit control, alt, delete, end task and close your browser. Um, you don't want to click any buttons on your screen. You want to just shut the browser down, let Windows shut it down for you. Because at this point in time, there is no malicious code on your computer. It's all hung up in your browser. So you just want to shut the browser off before you give uh, a button click that lets it download something. Um, and in this one, it does install uh, a couple of malicious, well, this isn't malicious code. It's Chrome's remote desktop host and an ad blocker as a Chrome extension, which is legitimate software, but is being used for bad reasons. So it's kind of one of those things where if you don't do remote desktop, why do you need Chrome remote desktop host? And it got put on there because the bad guys are using this to take over your computer and remote into it. Uh, and then here's the last one that I wanted to go over. So this was somebody who supposedly was from Alignable sending me text to my business phone, asking me how I was doing and told me they wanted me to give some advice about their business. And they uh, want me to give them my Google Hangout because it's much better because of the charges of dollars of SMS is too much. And so up until this point, I wasn't sure if this was for real or not. But then when I get that, I now I know it's fake because nobody says, hey, I'm going to SMS you. They say, I'm going to text you, first of all. Second of all, it's been decades since text cost money. Everybody's phone plan includes free text nowadays. Um, and then I saw, I, on the off chance, it was still a legitimate customer. I said, can you just, you know, schedule me a call and schedule an appointment? And they said, oh, I'm too busy for that. But, you know, can you just give me your Google Hangout username? Well, Google Hangout, quit being updated and used about five years ago. So the reason why they want that is because they can, it is very vulnerable to uh, hacking and they want to get my Google Hangout so they can hack my Google username and password. And why do they want my hacked email? Because according to this chart on the right side here, a hacked Gmail account is currently going for $80 on the dark web. Because like I mentioned earlier, you use it to log into your devices. You use it, you're, you're lazy and don't want to create accounts for everything else. So you just hit that login, use Google login or whatever button to create uh, user accounts for all your other uh, things as well. So that one con account controls a lot of things and that's why it's worth money. Um, it's actually worth the most out of anything. Uh, so, and then when I ignored them after 15, 20 minutes, uh, then they started sending me, you know, pictures of cute girls trying to get me to click a button or do something <laughs> and that is blocked them um so hopefully you've learned a few tips on uh making stronger passwords and doing some uh configuration settings that will allow you to make your computer much safer right where you're sitting and um and some some tips on how to spot a phishing email or a phishing text message and uh, and what to do, or actually in this case, not to do, which is don't click the buttons. Uh, if it's an email, hit that send a spam button if um, or block it. Uh, if it's if it's something that popped up on a website you were looking at, control alt delete end task and close your browser. And and if something does happen, um, you want to call the Internet Crime Complaint Center, the bottom line here on this slide, IC3. So just remember, it's IC3.gov. Uh, but more importantly, you can Google and find this if you just remember that you need to call the FBI, not the local police. Um, if anybody uh, takes over any of your accounts or steals your identity, opens credit cards in your name, any anything like that, um, or you think that they're going to um, you want to get a hold of the FBI because if you call the local police, they'll open a case, but they can't do anything because they don't have the resources. And then when it finally does get to the FBI, the FBI can't do anything because the local police started a case and now they have jurisdiction instead of the FBI. 
and you get stuck in this bureaucratic red tape circle that takes months to get out of. And with that, there's my contact information. You can always find me on Alignable. And that is the end of my slides. So if anybody has any questions, I would love to um, answer any. And I thank you guys for the opportunity to uh, listen to me babble on for a few minutes. And hopefully you learn something. Thank you so much, Todd. We'll take questions in one moment here. <laughs>